Hey guys, welcome to the Orthodox Christian Podcast. And today I wanted to make a topical video looking at the theme of creation in the Old Testament and connecting that to the baptism of Christ in the New Testament. And before we get into it, just two things to mention. One is that I am not an official mouthpiece of the Orthodox Church. So if you have questions about this and want to know the quote unquote official Orthodox stance, you can always meet with one of your local priests in the area and I'm sure they would be happy to speak further. There is also a uh, form in the video description where you can ask any questions and I can try my best to follow up with those. And the second thing to note is this video is in lieu of an interview that's normally posted on Friday. I do try to keep those as regular as possible, but occasionally there isn't an interview scheduled. And so when there is a gap like that, I will probably do a topical video like this. And if you'd like to see more of this kind of content, or if you have any feedback, uh, either positive or negative, either is totally fine, feel free to include that in the comments below. But without further ado, let me just give a uh, overview of what we'll be looking at today. So I've got three examples of creation in the Old Testament. One is from Genesis. One, well, actually two of them are from Genesis. One is the original creation in Genesis. The second is the story of the flood. And then we've got a story from Exodus, the uh, crossing of the Red Sea by the Israelites. And each of them have themes of creation that I want to explore. And then I'm gonna tie those together with the baptism of Christ, which is another creation account in the New Testament. Specifically, uh, I'm going to look at the Gospel of Mark. So um, some of the things that I talk about will kind of build sequentially as we go along. This is from Genesis 1 that I'm looking at right now. And if you're just listening to the audio of this podcast, I'd probably recommend checking out the video just so you can follow along a little better. But I'll try my best to uh, keep you up to speed either way. So I'm going to read from Genesis 1 and do some commenting along the way. This is Genesis 1 verse 1. Quote, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Two things to note there. One is that what you have pictured in Genesis 1 is actually a, uh, a world that is completely flooded by water, which isn't great. And over that, you have a spirit or a wind or a breath of God uh, sweeping over it. And those words, uh, wind, breath, spirit, those are actually all the same word in Hebrew and in Greek. So you can translate it either way. So when it says a wind from God, it could be translated as a spirit from God. Uh, but the main point here is that initially what you have is just these floodwaters that are totally engulfing the world. And that wasn't a great thing because life couldn't emerge in that situation. But also it was metaphorical in terms of suffering or disorder or chaos, because often in the Psalms, the Psalmist will say, save me from the waters, they've risen up to my neck. And then he'll refer to maybe a conflict with a friend or some enemies that are trying to take him out. And so water is used as a metaphor to speak about suffering, or at least too much water is used as a metaphor to speak about suffering. So just keep that in mind. This is now in verse six. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and God saw that it was good. So in this depiction, what you have is the flooded, wor flooded world and God places a dome in the middle of the waters and that separates the waters so that there's water above and there's water below because in the ancient world, the Hebrew people thought that when it rained, the doors of heaven were opened and the waters came down and there are also doors beneath that could open and that water could flood areas as well. So God separates the waters. And then with the waters underneath the dome, he groups those into certain areas so that the dry land can emerge. And the overall point here is that God separates the waters, he tames it, he puts it into particular regions so that it's not this chaotic, disordered mess, and that is what al allows life to emerge. Second thing to um, 
point out is the green highlights. And this is talking about the world as a temple. So then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Uh, that's verse 26. And then verse 27 is, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. So an image of God, if you think about this for a second, or if you study some ancient cultures, an image of God is an idol. It's something that represents the God that it's depicting to the worshipers. And as it were, gathers the worship of those worshipers in it or directs their worship up to God. So it's a, a mediator. And humanity is that mediator in the creation. They represent the purposes and ways of God to the created world. And also, in a sense, they gather up the worship of the world and direct it to God. Because I think they use the things of the world to worship God as means to God. And those things participate in the worship of God with them by being means to God. So that's kind of interesting that the whole world is depicted as this temple and humanity is depicted as so to speak, the idol in it as the image of God. And then God blessed them and said, so this is speaking to the people. Uh, and this is in verse 28, God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply. So this is the command that's given to Adam and Eve to fill the earth, to subdue it, to be fruitful and multiply. And we'll see that picked up with some of these other creation stories. But those three aspects recur through a lot of these stories of the waters being separated, of a uh, temple kind of image, and then of God telling people to be fruitful and multiply. So now we're in Genesis 6. This is the story of the flood. And you'll see these same thing, same themes come up. And I've highlighted them in the same way so you can see where the themes are connected. Uh, this is actually, uh, is it 6 that I'm going to start? Yeah, okay. This is six, verse 14. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. This is uh, God speaking to Noah. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. It's width, 50 cubits. It's height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. So this is specific instructions on how to build the ark. The only other place you find specific instructions in scripture is with the building of a temple and the tabernacle, which is a temple as well. So uh, there's a clear reference or connection here between the ark and a temple, which isn't surprising because we'll see that all of creation gets gathered within this little temple and preserved so that God can restart the creation. So now we're going down to chapter seven, verse 11. Yeah, 11, text is kind of small on my screen. On that day, all the fount fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. So um, God gathers all these animals and people inside the ark and then the uh, waters above and the waters below start coming back out. So we're seeing sort of the reversal of creation here rather than them being contained to their separate spots, they're emerging again and life is becoming more chaotic. On that very same day, this is verse 13. On that very same day, Noah with his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons entered the ark. They and every wild animal of every kind and all domestic animals of every kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every bird and every kind of every kind, every bird, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. So you have all the creation, going into the ark and it's sort of a procession as it were two by two it seems very orderly it seems like a church service it seems like something you would see in a temple and then there is the breath of life that is with these creatures and people in the ark and remember that breath can be translated as spirit so it is the spirit of god that is with these people in the ark and it's a little temple so the flood continued 40 days on the earth this is 717 and the waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters swelled and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the face of the waters. The waters swelled so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole earth were covered. The waters swelled above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. So on one hand, this is the return to what we saw originally in, Exodus, or in Genesis with a world that's completely flooded. So the waters filling up, filling up, filling up and covering even the mountains. But also, 
uh, you have the ark that's floating on top of that. And it's as if God is drawing that ark up to himself. It's like, this is the little outpost of the spirit of God that's being drawn up to God and preserved. And then when the waters recede, that little outpost is going to be dropped back down and then emerge again so that hopefully the world can become a temple as it was supposed to be. Uh, because the reason the flood is happening is because humanity has become extraordinarily wicked. And so God is removing his breath from humanity or his spirit from humanity, which is how humans live. They participate in life. They don't have life in and of themselves. God is the one who exists and hold thing, holds all things in existence. And so when these people departed from God, they departed from life. And then this is a way of depicting them uh, getting their just desserts. So then it goes to verse seven. Uh, we actually read that one. So ver chapter eight, verse one, and God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters gradually receded from the earth. As in the first creation, a wind or a spirit of God blows over the earth. The waters subside. They go back up to above the dome, they go back under to the seas and land emerges. And then God says to Noah and his family in verse 17, be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So same pattern. Now this is Exodus. It's interesting earlier in Exodus, I didn't include it here, but um, Exodus, just so you know, is like the story of Israel's liberation from Egypt, uh, slavery in Egypt to um, serving God. So they go from the master of Pharaoh to the master of God. And at the end, it's the tabernacle that's construction, constructed, which is a temple. So that's interesting to know. But uh, with Moses, he's originally placed in a basket, but the basket is an ark. Like it is the same word as an ark. And it's covered with pitch and bitumen the same way that the Ark of Noah was covered in those things. So there's this little allusion to the Ark. And then you see this theme of creation come out again when the Israelites cross the Red Sea because Pharaoh's army is pursuing them. So this is from 14 verse 21 in Exodus. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. So interesting that you've got the separation of waters and you've got the spirit or the wind or the breath of God blowing to make that happen. And then you've got the dry land that emerges and they've got the Israelites going forth. So all these little hints that this is a new creation, that something new is being created by God here. And then in verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth. So that's a connection with the flood because in the flood, you have the pres preservation of God's people and the destruction of those that are up opposed to God. And the same thing happens here where the waters come back down on the Egyptians that are pursuing the Israelites through the sea and they are drowned. And what's also interesting is, so like, I don't have a direct reference to the, the temple here or to uh, the command to be fruitful and multiply, but the reason Israel is drawn out of slavery in Egypt is so they can serve God. And the rest of Exodus is basically about the construction of the tabernacle, which is a temple that God fills with his spirit at the end of Exodus. So you do have that theme coming through. And then in terms of being fruitful and multiplying, well, it is this continuation of the promise really to Abraham that it comes up in Genesis, that the Israelites are called to be fruitful and multiply and become as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. And by being liberated, they're able to continue that. Okay, so now with those things in mind, we're just going to look briefly at uh, Gospel of Mark. This is Christ's baptism. And you'll see how some of these themes are coming to the fore. And just remember the separation of the waters, uh, the microcosm, or like the, the temple imagery, and then the command to be fruitful and multiply. And I will try my best to show how these are connected. So 
In those days, this is uh, Mark 1, verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So Christ goes into the water. He's submerged in the water and he comes out of the water. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved with you. I am well pleased. Uh, so that's definitely a strong connection to the creation with the spirit descending like a dove on him. That's the spirit flying over the waters. So we've seen that in all of the other stories. Also that pattern of the spirit descending and then a voice speaking is what we see in Genesis one. I didn't read that section, but when God creates the world, there's the spirit hovering over the waters. And then God says, let there be light. And so God says here, you're my beloved son or my son, the beloved with you. I'm well pleased. There's a connection that Christ is the light of the world uh, because that's what God created when he said, let there be light. It's not that Christ is created, but it's just meant to connect the idea that he is the light of the world and that there is a new creation that is going to emerge through Christ. And then you think, well, how is that going to happen? I think it's hinted at his baptism because he goes down into the water and then he emerges out of the water. Water was connected with suffering. Christ is going to die. He's going to be buried in the waters of chaos, as it were, and rise again. And that is going to create a new world because it is going to show humanity that death is not the end, but a beginning with God. And then the disciples are going to be called to go forth and multiply to make disciples of all nations and all peoples. So that's the continuation of be fruitful and multiply. And then in terms of the temple, I think that there's a really strong case to be made for the um, sort of switching of the temple from the one in Jerusalem to Christ, who is the new temple and location of God, and that Christ will also fill humanity with the Holy Spirit and each person who cooperates by faith with Christ will also be a little temple. But in terms of Mark's gospel, there's a lot of parallels between the temple at the end of the gospel and Christ, where he's going into the temple and he's teaching about the temple. And then he's saying, you see these stones of the temple and not one of these is going to be left. And then when he's on trial, they say, this guy said that he was going to tear down this temple and build it again in three days. And it's going to be a temple not made by hands. And then when he dies, the curtain of the temple is torn. And so all these things are meant to say that Christ is the new temple. And from him, he's going to sort of extend that to all Christians, all the little miniature Christs that are in the world. In any case, I find those kind of parallels really fascinating. If you want to see more videos like this, please let me know. If you thought this was wonderful, please let me know. If you thought it was horrible, please let me know. And there's also a form in the video description or a link to a form that you can ask any sort of question you may have about orthodoxy. And in the meantime, I hope that you have a peaceful week. Take care.